We're going to talk about the Swedish iron and steel industry. And uh, oh, I think I'm standing here. I'm um, welcome onto the stage Martin Lindqvist, CEO for SSAB, Swedish Steel, and Darren Wilson, CEO of LKAB Minerals. Global steel production is set to grow by a third to 2050, and steel plants are responsible for 9% of all emissions today. Last year, Sweden delivered the first steel produced without use of any fossil fuels. A big milestone, but how do we roll this out? Well, uh, Martin, I would like very, very short, what is hybrid? Uh, hybrid is actually this, producing fossil-free steel from a fossil-free value chain, a project we started together with uh, LKB and Vattenfall. And in my industry, we have been working with process development for the last thousand years and used uh, coal to take away oxide from, from the iron ore. And we have together in the uh, hybrid project developed a technique using hydrogen instead. So instead of getting carbon dioxide emissions, we get water as a waste or byproduct. And That's your, hybrid. your contribution to this is? Well, we are part of, of this group, and the idea came from my CTO back in 2016, and we thought it was a good idea and called up Vattenfall and LK and started the project, and here we are. So that was your initial reaction, that this was going to work? No, not, that, <laughs> not at all. I thought it was a nice idea, uh, interesting idea, and uh, to be honest, uh, the first time I really saw working was a year ago when we produced the first fossil free sponge iron but we have put in a lot of efforts a lot of r d a lot of money into the project and have been more and more certain but now we have proven that it works in in a fairly big scale darren is it a realistic vision to uh, reduce or the all the emissions from the industry uh, absolutely i mean the, the technology is now proven and i think although there was the i guess the initial skepticism because of the scale, the technology is there. It, it's all about scale. And I think the challenge is people probably don't realize just the sheer scale in terms of the electricity generation, the production of the, of the green hydrogen, the complete transformation of our part of the value chain, the, uh, the moving from iron ore pellets to sponge iron to conversion of the steel plant. The scale is huge. So, so it's technically possible. It will happen. It's scale. And I guess the political and societal <coughs> will to what that means in terms of the huge changes in infrastructure. And what are the, the main challenges, you think? Well, well, I think, I guess if you take a step back, and from a lot of the conversations this morning, if you look every year, the world emits 51 billion tonnes of CO2 equivalent, mainly CO2, but also methane and other things. Three quarters of that is energy, but only one third of that three quarters is electricity generation. So we think about that we need to convert from coal and gas to renewables. But actually, this two-thirds of the story are things that we need to electrify and convert to, to hydrogen. So the sheer scale that we have to start generating in a very different way, and that requires steel, it requires critical minerals, and so that larger picture is very important. And, and, and I, I guess just in terms of the scale po point, we've had decades of globalization where in the West, we probably almost forget where things come from and you know, what we have to do to change some of these critical supply chains. And that's part of the story of this. And I think the, the acceptance that we have to support and get our energy behind these projects if we want to make the change. But there's also a political risk, uh, the electricity. Martin, what do you say about people that are concerned about the electricity part? I think... Changing the industry will mean a lot of electrification, but we, so we will use even less energy in the future, but we will use electricity. I think we have a good chance in the Nordics to, to build out the electricity system in order to do that change in the industry. I'm more worried uh, short term or mid term that we don't have transmission possibilities enough. So this development goes quick, and it can, but it can go even quicker if you get uh, transmission so we get the electricity at the right pl place at the right time. Then we can do this even quicker. 
and the high cost costs for uh, electricity that we've seen? Well, that's for me a relative cost. I mean, compare northern Sweden to UK or to Germany or to Holland. So for me, the absolute cost is not that important. It's the relative cost. But I think with the plans we have in, in northern Sweden and northern Finland with all the wind power parks and so on, we will have, uh, I would say, decent electricity costs. So let's talk about the relative cost. What, what is the cost of doing this? I would put it the other way around. What, what is the cost of not doing this? Uh, the steel industry globally emits 7 to 9 percent of all the carbon dioxide, so we can't really afford not to do this. And if you take the cost of fossil free steel, I don't really know, but it's at the end product, it's insignificant. If you take a car and produce it in fossil free steel, the cost compared to the steel we use today, that's in insignificant. So I know you, you have already sold some. Is it the same cost to buy traditional steel from the hybrid? No, it's slightly more expensive because the, because the cost nowadays is slightly higher. But uh, right now we are not selling big volumes. We are selling for prototyping. We are delivering to Volvo, Volvo cars and others, and they are doing prototypes. But from 2026, we will start to sell big volumes. And it will be slightly more expensive, but for the end user, it will be insignificant. So this is done on commercial terms? Yes, this is a purely a commercial project, I would say. It started as a project to avoid carbon dioxide emissions, of course, and that's good. But now it's market demand driven. So this is actually asked for by end users and for, for, from big OEMs and, and users of steel. Any questions from the audience? Yeah. Uh, uh, what do governments and infrastructure clients need to do to stimulate scale-up of fossil-free steel? I think it's what I think is most important. First of all, we need help, of course, with power generation and power transmission. But, but another very important part is a level playing field. I think that the steel industry should and could afford to do this transformation on their own, with their own balance sheets. So if we start to see companies uh, being subsidized by taxpayers, I think that will be not good. So, so a level playing field for me is the most important part. We have a question here from the audience, but first I want to ask you, Darren, it, uh, are you uh, being able to, are you going to be able to meet the demand? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, Marty mentioned 2026. That's when it gets exciting going from the kind of pilot 100 tons into the millions of tons. So it would be about 1.3 million tons in 2026 production through to by just after 2030, over 5 million tons. So yeah, the, the LKAB has accelerated its plans to meet the accelerated uh, plans of, uh, of SSAB. I think the, but again, it comes down to the, to the scale. And when you were talking about costs from a, um, yeah, an optimistic view, I think our, our view increasingly is that in a free market world, this, this still floats. Um, it's about scale, and the larger the scale gets, the more the operating costs uh, that will come down. But let's not forget, we're looking to, at the end of all of this, convert all of our iron ore production to sponge iron. That's 24.4 million tons, which is fantastic. I mean, that's 90, over 90,000 tons a day. It's 45% of, of Sweden's rail freight. But that's in a, a global market of only of 1.8 billion. So uh, I think that the scale globally and to get back to the 51 billion tons of CO2, that's the kind of the critical part as well. But yeah, the, the capacity is there, it's, um, but there's a lot that's got to happen. Yeah. We had a question here from the audience. Patrick Carberg. Is this working? Excellent. Patrick Carberg, i -Core. The question is for um, SSAB. Uh, where do you get the hydrogen gas from now, and how do you see the scale up till 2026 to get access to that? Uh, in industrial scale. Thank you. Uh, in the hybrid project, we are producing our own hydrogen via electrolysis from fossil free electricity. We are also, as Anna alluded to, building uh, storage, hydrogen storage, and that's the plan to continue together in the, in the consortium to produce the hydrogen we need in order to produce sponge iron and then steel. If I could add, I mean, the the main hydrogen will ultimately come in, well, initially in Mount Berry, so on the LKB site, 
where at the moment now we, we mine the iron ore, we convert it into pellets and we sell that into the steel industry. That will be actually converted to sponge iron where we take out the oxygen that Martin uh, talked about. And so our biggest kind of operating costs and change will be the, the electrolyzers and the, the largest electrolyzers that will have, have been built so far, going from around 50 megawatts to 600 megawatts and all, everything that's associated with that. So that's the, the, the exciting bit that we'll see in Mount Berry 8 in 2026. Yeah, we have another question here. <coughs> Hello, uh, Anna Mann from Skanska. First of all, just to say this is fantastic. I heard about it before and amazing. I just wondered, will you and when will you share the technology and the research with the wider industry with your competitors. Of course, you've got to get return on your investment, but that's a real challenge for you, isn't it? Because we want the whole world to benefit from this amazing advancement. Well, we haven't really decided on that one yet. We are in the process of developing the technique. We are running the pilot plant. We are producing one ton per hour. We are scaling it up in Malmberg from 2026. We have a lot of interesting IP and patents uh, pending. Uh, we will eventually share it, yes, but we also think that uh, it is uh, a good thing for us to be first on the market with this, and we will share it with the customers to start with, and they are using this deal already and are quite happy with the properties and everything. So let's see in the future uh, when and how. As we heard earlier today, it's very important to, to share uh, uh, to share what you come, your inventions to get forward. Uh, but uh, do you have any feeling for when? Because you have, there are uh, other competitors, there are ArcelorMittal, Sidervind, and Swedish alternative. No, but I think, first of all, when we started this project, if you put it very nicely, a lot of other companies thought that we were at best naive, and now everyone is saying that we'll do something similar. And I think that's good, because it's so important to lead the way and show it is that it is possible. And of course, we will, in some way or form, share that technique with that we have developed, but we need to develop it all the way to start with before we do that. So I think it is a possibility. And I was very often invited to different conferences as a funny guy from a hard to abate industry. And I was just showed up on the scene for, as a representative for an industry that couldn't do anything. And I was always claiming, or started to claim that it was possible. And, and uh, now we have shown that it is. And, and then, of course, I think uh, leading by example will also help. But at the end, as said before, I think this will be end user demand driven. So, there will be no room for industries uh, emitting a lot of carbon dioxide, and there will be a lot of stranded assets. So I think, uh, I'm quite positive, I think this development will uh, go quicker and quicker, and a lot of others will follow, which is positive. It's lo a lot of uh, curiosity around this project, isn't it? Yes. And what do you hear from your customers? Well, <laughs> I, I could ABC. spend my, together with LKB and Vattenfall, I could spend uh, my full week meeting customers. We have a lot of visitors up in Luleå from, from customers, from governments, from uh, everything. And uh, there's a huge interest. And I, I think that, uh, as said, this is driven by us as end users and customers. And if at the end, a new car with fossil free steel, the cost difference compared to a uh, car with, with normal steel, so to say, is very, very limited, we will all go for fossil free cars or cars produced from fossil free steel. So using hybrid would be an investment done with the wallet and the heart? Sorry. Uh, it's uh, good for the climate, and it's also nothing. It's not more ex more expensive than I buying see, normal. I steel. see it from our point of view as a huge business opportunity that is also very good for the climate, and that's the driver behind it. Yeah, we have another question here from the audience. Great discussion, Thomas Hale from Oxford University. Can you say a bit more on this theme of how your innovation goes to the world, specifically around China? 
Sweden's total emissions are something around 50 million, less than 50 million tons of carbon per year. China's steel industry alone is 2 billion tons. So how do we make this work for the climate? I think China is obviously one of the countries extremely interested in this technique and, and wants to uh, develop it as well, which is very, very positive. When we started the project, we thought that it might be interesting in Europe and as from end users, maybe, then automotive in Europe, but we see it from all over the world now. If someone would have told me four, three, four years ago that the interest would be huge in US, I would have doubted it, but even in US, the, the interest is uh, really high. So there is uh, interest from China, and they are also looking into possibilities. Uh, Bao Steel is one of the biggest steel companies in the world. They are looking into this uh, possibility as well. Yeah. Darren? Well, if I could add a point on the, on the global perspective. Um, obviously, th this initiative for us, or it's more than an initiative, is it's also about developing the, the mines going deeper, developing reserves beyond 2060, and everything we've talked about with Sun Giant. But it's also about um, extracting critical minerals from our uh, mine waste. And I think one of the, the, the kind of stories for society now is around thinking, where do materials come from? And so we, we think about um, uh, wind farms. We've talked about those quite in quite a few of the, the talks today. Rare earth elements, neodymium, really critical parts for those. 91% of those are processed in China, even though actually they're all around us. And so a big part of what we'll be doing in Lulio is producing rare earth elements and phosphates and things. So it's just an, an important part. And with the geopolitical things that have happened recently, it's around recognizing that if we want these things, we can't bury our heads in the sand and think that we get the raw materials from different parts of the world and we don't think where they come from. We have to take responsibility regionally. And, uh, and so, so I think in terms of, if we take China and the example there was on, the, on steel, but actually around kind of control of key critical minerals, a big part of this overall story is how do you shorten supply chains so we're not moving things around the world with all of the CO2 that is associated with that. But we also, without securing those supplies, we can't make the major infrastructure changes that need to happen for all the industrial processes like ours to change. As you mentioned earlier, your production chain will change a lot. You have a massive uh, work ahead of you. Can you explain more about it? Well, I mean, starting with the mine, we've got to go deeper. We've got to have completely different methods of decarbonized methods, automation, It'll be main, not many people going down the mines uh, in the future, so we bring it to the surface in a zero way. Um, we, most mining operations have mine waste. That actually isn't waste. There's a huge amount of resource there. And, and I guess just a, a point to add on that, that I think is an important one, because people would say, well, it's not finite resource, and it's a statement of, of obvious mathematical fact that you can't keep mining things out of the ground. But there is not the mass balance of materials in the world now to do all of the things we need to do to decarbonize. You, know, you, you could take old technology like a steam engine that's 600 tons, and you wouldn't be able to make a single iPhone out of it, because an iPhone's got 75 elements in it. And so I, I think that's changing for us on the value chain of extracting every bit of value uh, is, is critical. Uh, and we need to think about our mindset on extraction. Um, so, so, so say there was an amazing deposit on the outskirts of Stockholm or London of some of these critical minerals. Can you imagine the challenges there would be in extracting it there, and we'd almost certainly say, no, we can't do it, we can't do that, and then we'll take it from another part of the world where we don't control the conditions that it's extracted in, the fact that we're moving out of the world. So there's a, there's a much bigger picture to all of this. Yeah. Well, we have a lot of questions here up on the wall. Um, do you see nucle nuclear energy as a vital part in scaling hybrid steel making and uh, associated green hydrogen? I think um, every source is important. For us, it must be fossil free, and, and nuclear power for me is fossil free, but mm. the, not the only solution, of course. We, we need all the solutions we have, I and mean, we need more of them in, in Sweden and Finland. Uh, what impact do you think the carbon border mechanism will push fossil free steel? I think it will be helpful. I think that we should uh, reduce the free allowances quicker than the 
ideas are right now, but I think uh, CBAM is important. I think uh, the whole Fit for 55 program is important, but it's maybe a little bit too slow. What, what would be a, a good pace? I don't know, but I think if we have solutions and we see that there are solutions, I think uh, uh, we should put more pressure on the industry. Do we need more from uh, pressure from the authorities? No, I think, as I said in the beginning, I think this will, the pressure will come from end users and that will speed it up. I think from politicians, I like the idea of politicians putting pressure and demand on industries and then industries responding and then the politicians and the governments and the societies needs to uh, <laughs> pace um, the, and give the possibilities for the industries uh, to transform because when industries and companies see that there are opportunities it will move quite fast. But this is a, a major opportunity and your uh, impact of the your business impact of the world is, is huge, and if you succeed with this, it, it would benefit us all. It wouldn't it be great to have uh, maybe the end users need more pushing them from the authorities? No, but I think, yeah, of course, but I mean, we will start to produce steel next year in the US without any emissions, and then from 2026 in Oxalazone, we will produce without a fossil free steel without any emissions and then 2030 we will be completely fossil free. We will invest as a company and we are not a huge company but we will invest around 50 billion to do this and when we look at uh, that calculation it looks uh, very very appealing and then I guess then with, with big companies like Volvo, Daimler and others very interested that will push other steel companies as well to go in the same direction. So I call it internally leading by example, showing the way and, and show that this is possible. That's how we try to do it. We have some more questions here. Um, how do you look upon carbon <coughs> capture and storage as a net zero solution? Can CCS help us produce fossil free steel for cheaper? For us, that's not the solution. I think the, the, the best thing is to take away the problem instead of trying to cure it with some, something else. So we have looked into it and found out that CCS is nothing for us. We'd rather take away the, the carbon dioxide emissions than try to hide them somewhere. I'm not saying that it's bad because everything that is uh, reducing emissions is, of course, good. But for us, it's not good enough. I would agree as well, but I think there are some industrial processes uh, like with lime and some parts of cement where there's actually chemical CO2 that's released and where maybe carbon capture does have a place. But at scale, the, the best thing to do is to just eliminate it altogether rather than try to, to store it. But there is a place for it in some industrial processes. I think we have time for just one more question from the audience. Uh, if a significant part of the steel that you produce is used for making cars, will you see future consumption declining due consumer behavior like ride hailing? From anonymous. I didn't get that. Neither did I. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone let, else? Let, let's pick another question. <laughs> okay. Our, yeah, other, other steel producers are following SSAB's lead, yes. Okay, how do you, uh, do you think SSAB will be um, evaluated in the future? As a company without any emissions and uh, with, uh, I mean, the vision from the beginning was to create the fossil-free value chain. And we talked about mining, we talked about energy, we talked about steel production, but we also talked about uh, fossil-free trucks, fossil-free dumpers, fossil-free cars. So as a very important and integrated part of a fossil-free value chain. And um, that will give uh, some value to it as well. But do you, will you get a higher value? Of course. Good. Good ending for this. Thank you very much. Thank you.